All right, welcome to This Week in Health IT. It's Newsday. Today, Apple had a worldwide developer conference, and we will talk about that. A forecast that says care is moving out of the hospital over the next 10 years. And so we will discuss that as well with Eli Tarlow, who is our guest today. Uh, my name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for 16 Hospital System and creator of This Week in Health IT, a channel dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. Special thanks to our sponsor today, Serious Healthcare. And, you know, we really appreciate them. They've been investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health IT leaders. And uh, we are so thankful they are a part of our mission. If you want to be a part of our mission as well and become a show sponsor, send an email to partner at thisweekinhealthit.com. All right, quick note. Before we get to Eli, and Eli is patiently waiting, um, check out our latest article on the changing role of the CIO. It's out on our website, thisweekhealth.com. It just went out last week. It's a great piece highlighting interviews from B.J. Moore, Ed Marks, William Walters, Teresa Springman, Craig Richardville, among others. Uh, the role is changing, and check out how, right from those who are living it, so... All right. Today, we're joined by Eli Tarlow, a recovering CIO and a client advisor for Serious Healthcare. Uh, Eli, welcome. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bill. And thanks for having me again. It's always a, a great pleasure when we get a chance to uh, to chat. So you are a recovering CIO. So I have Drex on who, who coined the term recovering CIO. And uh, so you were, how long were you a CIO? So yeah, I think it was like 12 steps. I think I just finished. I had my, uh, um, yeah, so I was, uh, before I joined Sirius, I was a CIO of a hospital in, in Brooklyn, Brookdale Hospital there for a couple of years. Before that, a CIO at Bellevue Hospital. And, you know, I'm sure people have heard fa famous Bellevue Hospital, Manhattan, Metropolitan Hospitals. I've been a CIO for hospitals for many, many years. Been in the, in the healthcare IT leadership um, part of the, you know, just a healthcare IT leader since 2001. Uh, before that, in other sectors and other industries, so. Bellevue has a has an interesting history. I mean, when it was founded, it was essentially free care to the to the community. Yeah, a couple of a uh, couple of so I was there for a little over five years as CIO. A couple of quick notes since you brought it up. Number one is uh, Bellevue has been around since before we were actually a country. Bellevue has been around for two hundred and ninety years, I believe, give or take. So before we actually existed as United States, they're the longest running hospital. There was only a hundred days in all that time that they weren't in business. Um, that was right after Hurricane Sandy when I was actually employed there. And that was the only gap in their ability to provide care. An incredible organization, incredible hospital, part of the overall New York City health and hospital system. Yeah, uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, swamped the, uh, the parts of New York were just completely swamped. So that impacted uh, Bellevue pretty significantly. Yeah, we um, you know we began with shelter in place. You know what I learned during that time was just a remarkable, remarkable experience. Um, what I what I learned was that you don't really have the option as a hospital organization to just make decisions on whether you're going to you know empty out your hospital when it is a uh, when there's a situation that's arising. You have to actually you know patients have to go other places, and so because of where we were on the water table, we were advised um, to do shelter in place. Um, the team did a remarkable job just making sure the patients stayed. Um, cared for. And what most people don't know, unless they really, really read up on, on the situation there is, and, and, and Bill, you and I have talked about this, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. It wasn't the medical staff. It wasn't anything other than the fact that we didn't have um, the uh, potable water. So we had emergency generators running, we had patients taken care of, but people couldn't actually um, functionally use the facilities. And, you know, you st sometimes you really, you really learn about how important housekeeping is and how important the engineering team is and essentially, that's what led to the um, to the discharge, the quick discharge of well, I shouldn't say discharge, but transition of care to other hospitals in the area. So, 500 plus patients all um, uh, evacuated from the hospital. No vertical transportation. 20 plus stories all down steps. So, a waiting uh, parade of ambulances, and every patient uh, not only survived but had had a good outcome. So, at the last uh, serious healthcare to healthcare event. I was talking to some people that were uh, CIO and, and CTO at one of the other hospitals in New York, and they they tell of harrowing stories of just you know the first couple of floors loaded with water, and uh, they they got everybody everybody had to leave their hospital. They had no uh, ability to really provide care um, because you know critical <laughs> at that point you know this this is how we used to think. You know, we put that data center in a place that 
you know, it was the least expensive real estate in the place, which was the basement. And who knew that, uh, you know, that the Hudson river could uh, come up that high, I guess. And, uh, yeah. We were fortunate and our data centers were elevated. Uh, and I think it was the fifth and sixth floors. The problem was that our, um, the, the pumps, um, for the emergency generator were in the basement. And so when water kind of breached the walls, the pumps were dead, whatever the fuel was left in the generator was all we had left. It was a couple hours of life safety basically left. And we actually formed what they nicknamed the Bellevue Bucket Brigade, where we had people wrapped around the staircases to the generator, handing buckets of fuel to fill it up. Um, you know, and I know we want to talk about other news, but just the last thing I'll say is, you know, they, they say you learn about the, um, you learn about the loyalty of your staff in, the, in, in those times of crisis. You know, they either, they either run towards you or they run away from you, right? And, you know, we, wouldn't, we didn't leave for a week. And uh, you can imagine that was without showers. And I was just hoping that they would be less loyal and start running away from me and not shower <laughs> for five days. But it's a great, great team, super proud. It's a time in my life I'll never forget. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And we, and we could talk about disaster recovery stories, uh, you know, all day because they're, they're, they're pretty amazing. They're pretty amazing how people do step up. The camaraderie that's developed during those those times are pretty amazing. Uh, but just the stories, it's 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 like you know you sit there and you make the best plan you possibly can, and then it's that little whatever it is, that one little thing that you're like, oh gosh, that's a lot more important than we thought it was, and it's in the wrong place, and it's going to bring all the best laid plans on all the large systems and whatnot. It could it could bring it down. You really have to think through every aspect because a, a disaster just it, it doesn't uh it, it doesn't discern it just does what it does yeah you know there's an overused phrase right people process and technology <clears throat> everything will fail you know at some point i shouldn't say that but you know things are likely to fail and <clears throat> if you have good people you will succeed and if you don't doesn't matter how strong your technology or processes are it all comes down to the people yeah and we're going to talk about people today because uh People keeps coming up. I, I, I'll tell you, this is, let's, let's start it off with this. This is out of the blue, but I'll go over here to LinkedIn. And I just commented on this a couple seconds ago. So it's pretty fresh. But Judy Kirby, uh, who we all know, uh, Kirby, uh, Kirby and Associates, Kirby and Consultants. Partners. Yeah, Kirby Partners. Thank you. Uh, does recruiting in the healthcare space. She posted a, a, a poll on LinkedIn and she said, what's your take? Will people opting not to return to the office be perceived as less engaged or not? And then she has four answers. Yes, definitely. It depends on the person. No, not at all. It's too early to say. And I was reading that question. And I thought I had the answer that I want to give. And then I have the answer that I think is going to happen. And there are two different answers. So, you know, do I think that people who choose to remain fully remote will be perceived as less engaged? I think what's actually going to happen is, yes, they're going to be perceived as less engaged. They're not going to be there for the hall, hallway conversations. They're not going to be there for things. But what do I hope happens? I hope that we change the culture to adapt to having people be included in some way if they choose to be remote, because there's very good reasons to be remote. So I, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So I, I thought a lot about this, you know, when I was a CIO, it was it was all work from the office. I mean, I wore a suit and tie, including Fridays, right? When there was no dress, there was no dress down. You never knew if you were going to have an executive meeting there. And now, you know, working for Sirius, it's entirely remote. Um, I haven't seen our headquarters yet. Um, and and really, when I think about this, it's uh, the one word that comes to mind is balance. There's nothing in this world, I believe, that is good if taken to an extreme. People talk about whether working from home is great or not great. I think it's applicable in different areas. I think there are certain things that you cannot do um, as well when you're remote. I think there's things that you'll do better when you're remote. You know, I, you know, someone who needs to be in front of clients and, and selling, right? There's, there's no value in them sitting in an office. They're wasting their, their time and they should be out in, in the field. You know, someone who needs to have bedside manner um, and, and really there's, a, there's a, that personal touch. You know, you can argue that being, being distant or being remote um, is at a disadvantage. I think, it, I, I think overall, we've been really, really heavy on being in person more than we needed to be, you know, being on site. I think what, one of the things that COVID did, forcing people to work remote, is it, it highlighted a reality that we were too much to an extreme about. You know, there was almost like the default was you work on site and there's an exception basis if you wanted to work remote. I do think, you know, as far as being engaged, 
um, and this is talking to many of my, <clears throat> excuse me, many of my colleagues, I think really it highlights a person's engagement when they're remote. I don't think it changes their engagement. I think there are people that have been engaged and they are even more so, in, or at least attempting to be engaged when they're remote because they, they don't want to lose what they have if they like to work remote. And then frankly, there are people that may not have been as engaged at work and now you know they're out of sight, out of mind and maybe they're less engaged being remote. But I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a you know, peanut butter spread or, or one answer fits all. Well, let me, let me give you a different one. Again, it is social. I happen to be active on social media this morning for, you know, preparing for the show and preparing uh, a lot of time I'll, I'll scan things. And I saw this post and, um, you know, who do you think has the advantage here? And it's, it's from Derek a er, Derek doesn't have his last name on here. He's an information security manager at a healthcare or hospital. And he said, we've mired our defenders down with administrative nonsense. Imagine a police department that put cops on the streets for just 23 minutes per shift in a city of 20,000 or more. And then he has this, this list, and he has a picture. And he said, you know, what the attackers, uh, cybersecurity again, right? So what the attackers are doing right now, their priorities are number one, reach the network. Number two, monetize. He goes, what the defenders will do today. In other words, what him and his department will do today. He said, number one, Four hours of meetings. Number two, status updates. Number three, add notes and tickets. Number four, timesheets. Number five, HR mandated training. Number six, close tickets for false positive. Number seven, update slide decks. Number eight, update policies. Number nine, 23 minutes in defense work. And then he has in a circle, he says, who, who will win? And I, I say all that to say, it's kind of comical. It's kind of funny. The reason it's kind of comical and funny to me is because I lived it. We have a a meeting culture. I mean, we, we have a meeting and PowerPoint culture. Um, is there, I mean, is there a way to get beyond this that we are actually spending more time, you know, making the lives of clinicians better and more time making the lives of, of patients better and more times defending. Um, and I, I know that those are kind of Pollyanna kind of <clears throat> comments because those meetings and a lot of those meetings, we do that work, but is there a way to get out of this meeting centric culture? Yeah, well, first of all, I think the biggest disservice, uh, I can't say a brand name, but let's just say uh, maybe a, uh, an email calendaring program that m almost all of us use. Um, I think the biggest disservice they ever did was that if you notice out of the box, the default meeting time is one hour. You have to actually go in and change it to be 15 minutes or a half hour. What if the default meeting time was a half hour? And you, how many people do you think would actually go in and make that a full hour? I think we just say, okay, let's just make it an hour. And then what do we say? Oh, great, good news, guys. We gave you 15 minutes free back, right? In your day, if we ended 45 minutes, right? We, we all get excited. We have 15 minutes left. And, and that just prepares us for the next hour long meeting, right? Or 45 minutes if we get lucky. So I think number one, to your point, Bill, yeah, where communication is important, right? And again, this comes back to balance. So we want to make sure everybody knows everything. In healthcare, we, we, we tend to over-communicate because under-communicating can actually, God forbid, lead to you know, a bad outcome for a patient. So we want to really, really make sure. I mean, we do timeouts before surgical procedures, right? We, we, we have to over-communicate to make sure every single I is dotted. And so that healthcare as a whole, we have to, and we still have to remain focused on, on communication. So we want to make sure everybody's in the loop. Also, you mentioned about policies, right? So Again, you know, look at policies, you know, we're measured by if we have a policy and if we follow the policy, you I mean, know, when joint commission comes in, they don't, they, they less question whether your policy was correct. I mean, they do obviously, but they were more focused on, it does a policy exist? Is it a, a systematic failure or is it an individual failure? So right away, we jump to creating effective policies. And I think it just comes back to what I said earlier. It's about balance. We have to communicate. We don't, we shouldn't over communicate. We have to have policies. We shouldn't, have policies that are, you know, losing the sight of the box, right? We're, you know, we're, we're thinking so far out of the box, we actually lost sight of purpose. I guess to directly answer your question about we, you know, how do we get out of excess meetings? Um, I think, I think as good leaders, you know, we do certain things that make that leading succinct, right? If, if we come in and, and this is just, you know, um, meeting 101, right? If you come in and it's, you know, and there's no, there's no formal agenda, there's no, there's no follow-ups, there's no accountability, and it's a, a, it's a discussion, it's a kumbaya, then it's a 45-minute waste. But if, it's, if your meetings are calculated as a business, then I think there's a lot of value to it. I think it'll be interesting is if people start to actually um, uh, capture the cost of these meetings in projects, right, which many already do, you'll start to see maybe, you know, okay, well, we, we got too far. So, sorry, little tooth. Little you mouth. know, let me, let me, let me get... <laughs> Here, my, my approach to the meeting centric culture was um, my, we, we allowed our kids to drink at home. 
So all of our kids are older. They've all gone off to school. And uh, at least two of them had this comment when they came back from school. They went to college. And, uh, and, and we like wine. We were part of a wine club and that kind of stuff. So we drink good wine. And my kids <laughs> on several occasions said to me, said, you know, uh, I said, well, so do you drink a lot at, at school? They're like, no, the stuff's not that good. Your stuff's so much better. It's, and so what they did is they learned to appreciate good stuff. So they went to that party. They were just like, I'm not going to get drunk just to get drunk. I want to drink, you know, good wine and good. And, and as you know, they don't have that at college. That's not what the, the goal is. Um, and part of the reason I share that story is to say, that's what we did with meetings. We said, all right, we're going to show everyone what good meetings look like. So after a while, they become discerning and they look at it and go, that wasn't a good meeting or that person doesn't put on good meetings. We need to do something to make those meetings better. Not that I was going to dictate, hey, this is the format for all the meetings moving forward, but I wanted people to be in good meetings that were short, crisp, got to the point, uh, had the, 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 uh, the conversation that we needed to have around the topic. That they just became more discerning and they go, all right, this is what it looks like. And then eventually my team ended up developing the, the, a great framework. And it, it sort of struck me when they came to me and said, we need to have more meetings. I was like, that's the opposite of what I want. They said, trust us. We know what we're doing. And then they laid it out for me. And they said, look, we're going to have meetings that look like this at this time and this time. And what you're going to see eventually happen is a whole bunch of these meetings are going to drop off. And they were exactly right. And they just went to those stand-up meetings that, you know, the lean stand-up meetings in the morning and at night. And I'm like, man, people aren't going to want to meet at morning and in the afternoon. And sure enough, they met less during the day because they were focused in the morning and they knew that they were going to have a follow-up in the afternoon. They didn't need to call another meeting. Because the, the primary people they were going to talk to were going to be there. And they just created a very efficient flow of uh, meetings and a structure for meetings. Yeah. So I, me, sometimes it works. Yeah, I know you remind me. One of, when I would have meetings at you know, the most recent hospital I was at, and they were my meetings, I would start off by saying, this is the goal of this meeting. The first thing I would say is this is the goal of this meeting. Sometimes it could just be a weekly update of all the projects. And the goal would be right awareness and follow-ups, et cetera. And then at the end of the meeting, I always say, I would kind of discuss, like recap, was the goal met or not? And it was interesting to see when my staff would, would want to draw me into a meeting and either to get me to participate, they would start off in the email by saying, hey, Eli, can you join this in this meeting? This is the goal of the meeting. Or if I would participate in one of their meetings, they would automatically start off by saying, this is the goal of the meeting. And at the end, they would kind of come back and say, was the goal met? And it's 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 a change of th of thought around around that. But it, you know, when they saw me doing it, they started doing it as well. And then yep. you kind of have accountability at both ends of it. I'll tell you, the craziest meeting I ever called was a, a cadence meeting. We called it the project cadence meeting, and we had every project present to the uh, VP and above within within the IT department. Right. So the project manager came in, and any key owner would come in and present, and we gave them four slides. Present in four slides. You know how hard that is for we had a hundred. Uh, at the time, I think like 100 and something to 115, 120 projects. And you say, hey, use these four slides. Well, you would think we'd ask people to like solve world hunger because they're like, oh, I can't tell you about my projects in four slides. I'm like, I, you can't tell me about it in 20 slides. So you might as well just make it succinct to four slides. That the first time we did that meeting, we set aside four hours and my team was like, ah, oh, don't do this to us. This is crazy. And, uh, and I said, I'm like, look, the goal for this is I'm tired of being the intermediary. I know what's going on in all 110 projects because people come to the CIO, but you guys don't know what's going on in each other's projects. And I, I can't tell you the number of times there's so many dependencies that you guys just don't know about. And so we did that first cadence meeting and we set aside four hours, ended up taking six hours. And uh, at, when we were done, I'm like, okay, was that worth it? And they're like, oh, absolutely. I, it's, it's amazing how many things that came up. And then that meeting got much more crisp, much shorter. People understood what it meant to do a four slide presentation on a project and what we were looking for, what we were after, you know, what are the dependencies? What, what does leadership need to know? What's going to cause this project to fail? I mean, these were the important things, but sometimes you need to have the six hour meeting in order to get everybody on the same page to eliminate some of those things. I'm sorry, I'm pontificating. Let's get to the, right. you want to talk about the news? Sure. I was just going to say one last thing. I don't know if it's a half joke or half truth, but you know, they say, if you're about to send a colleague an email, pick up the phone. If you're about to call your colleague, meet the, meet, meet the guy in person. And if you're about to meet the guy in person, do the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. All right. That gets us off. 
Hey, all we've done is the back and forth intro for you and I. Let's get to the news. All right. So this is, uh, let's see, where does this come from? This is modern healthcare, which means it's behind a paywall. I happen to pay for that paywall because I appreciate a lot of the, the stuff they do. But since it's behind the paywall, I'll do, I'll do a little more reading than usual. And this is, uh, they have a forecast. Care is moving out of the hospitals over the next decade. All right. So let me give you some of the context. Health systems might want to hold off on expanding inpatient services during the next decade and move more investments to ambulatory surgical centers and outpatient settings. And as you and I both know, there's, I, I'm talking to hospitals, you're talking to hospitals, they're still building towers. So uh, that work is still underway. That's according to a new national report out that predicts that where care will be delivered over the next decade, inpatient discharge volumes overall will decline by 1% by 2029, while outpatient volumes will increase by 19%. And ambulatory surgical centers will see a growth of 25% over that same time period. The report from market analysts and insight company SG2 adds to a growing collection of data showing that there will be lower acuity care delivered and it will be delivered outside the hospital walls. All right, let me give you a couple more things. So that's the general context. That's the study. That's what's going on. The move away from inpatient care is being driven by a few factors. Uh, there are more innovations in medical technology that allows for less invasive procedures and therefore less of a need for all the bells and whistles of hospital that a health hospital provides. There's also been considerable growth in ambulatory surgery centers, partly due to financial backing from private equity firms. The shift will accelerate as CMS eventually allows all previously inpatient only procedures to be done in other settings and expands upon the things ASCs can do by the end of 2023. And then it goes on to talk about the growth in physician offices and what's gonna go on there. And, um, and they talk about the, uh, ga the gaps in the continuum of care. And uh, other findings include that emergency department volume will increase by 5%. Urgent visits will decline by 15% uh, in the ED. Behavioral health visits will increase. And uh, in addition, skilled nursing facility volumes will decrease by 5% by 2029 and home care will increase by 15%. So I, I'm trying to figure out if I want to give you an open-ended question or a more specific question. The, the specific question would be, what does this mean for our building project? The general question would mean, would probably be, uh, you know, do you agree with this? Are we seeing this? Are we going to see this move to the home? Let's start with the general question. Absolutely. Um, number one is the answer is absolutely yes. Um, my my most recent uh, CIO job at Brookdale Hospital, we actually were merged with two other hospitals, as public knowledge, with um, Kingsbrook and Interfaith. And the idea was, this was actually announced a few weeks ago formally, was to actually move all inpatient services out of one of those hospitals. So I, I, I was there. I lived through the whole strategy component of that. Before that, I was with the hospital system, 11 hospitals that came together Hospitals are either merging and inpatient and they're kind of collecting or combining inpatient services. And many hospitals are actually closing down or filing for bankruptcy because they can't, um, they, you know, their whole model was based on things that are no longer necessary. And um, I don't, don't call me the exact numbers, but I believe in just 2021 to date, being that it's in June, seven hospitals already closed this year, 21 last year. I think it was almost 50 the year before. And you know, going back to 2018, it was... 20 plus or something like that. So we see hospital closures happening across the board. It's not because people are getting healthier necessarily. I would love to believe that. And maybe that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, but it's because they're, they were previously designed for inpa inpatient services. And as you mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a steadily steady decrease um, in patient services, which means, you know, excess uh, inpatient capacity. Um, if you staff a hospital, you don't change your staffing models. You don't change, you know, the services you provide. Um, you're, you're, you're running hospitals at a deficit. It's no different than air, airlines. You know, if, if people um, were starting to whatever reason, travel in business class, first class, and most of your plane remains coach class, you're going to be flying with empty seats and, you know, th it's just cost prohibitive. So the, the number one is absolutely um, there's a decline in, I wouldn't say in the need necessarily for inpatient services, but there's a de definitely a decline in inpatient services in a hospital setting, in an, in an acute care setting, um, that's my larger answer. Yeah, and, and we've seen this. I, I played golf with a guy this week who had his hip replaced three weeks ago, 
And I, I, I sort of scratched my head. I'm like, I remember my mom going through this and it took a long time. I mean, first of all, that the, you know, he had a little incision, uh, uh, barely even noticeable. And, you know, they went in there and did all the work and that kind of stuff. And he showed me the, the x-ray and, you know, he did his bionic man, which everyone likes to talk about. And then he, uh, he talked about, you know, he was, he was on a cane for a week. He was walking after the first week. He was hitting with a seven iron within two and a half weeks. And now he's out playing 18 holes of golf at, you know, at the three week mark. I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that's happening. And that's, that's, I mean, that's just one procedure. We, we know that that's happening across the board. We're getting better. We're getting better at getting people out of the hospital and uh, in healthier state than we used to after long uh, periods of stays and those kind of things. So the, the acuity level in the hospital is, is going to go up and we need those things. Um, but there's going to be less stays in the hospital and less need for, for those services. So what does this mean for uh, building projects? How should we be thinking about building projects? We still need towers, right? We just had COVID. I mean, if any case could be made for, we need beds for certain periods of time in, in our, in our history. I mean, the, the case has just been made that beds are, are important in the communities unless we can do COVID care out of the home. But at this point, it's, it's still in the hospital setting. That was a very, it's a high acuity uh, situation, clearly with the hundreds of millions of deaths that we, we've seen, or hundreds of thousands of deaths in the, in the U.S. that we saw. Um, you have uh, uh, the need for high acuity care and the need for those beds. But what does this mean? Uh, how, do we, how do we approach this? Let's first of all, from a healthcare standpoint, and then I want to take you in the technology route around this. Yeah, well, I want to I I come at it from two angles. Number one is the hospital will continue to exist, right? So what should that look like, right? If, if we're going to build new towers and we're going to build hospitals, what, you know, how do we prepare for that? What, you know, what are we building for, for five years? And then the second thing is, you know, why, why and what is now happening outside of the hospital? Um, and, you know, to your, well, first of all, why, why would someone not want to go to a hospital for many reasons? Number one is, um, you kind of can get sicker in a hospital, right? You can go in for hip replacement, catch something in a hospital. Um, someone has a different type of a health issue that's, you know, it's a airborne, airborne pathogen or whatever that might look like. You went in for a procedure. Why would you ex go into a place where you're exposed to greater risk than you need to, right? So we always want to have the lowest, you know, risk where we're, we're being cared for. So, you know, the, the argument wouldn't be like, why not be cared for? in a hospital, the argument should be, why do you need to be cared for a hospital? And one of the things we saw with COVID was um, we turned those hospital rooms into things that they weren't. People were, you know, it was, we, we were challenged. We didn't have enough rooms. Um, we had rooms designed for other things and we kind of quickly flipped them around and made them, you know, as best as we could to treat COVID patients. So what we, you know, one of the big lessons from COVID is we have to be a little bit more flexible in our design around what, what the future hospital room looks like. You know, we, we can't have a hospital room that's only for um, airborne, you know, diseases, right? We have to have them a little bit more modular or flexible, whatever that right, right word is. Um, you know, obviously there's a higher cost for care in a hospital, right? So we try to look for lower costs and, and payers are, are very well aware of that, right? They're not going to pay for a procedure at, a, at an emergency, emergency department rate um, or an acute care rate if they know that you know, other hospitals are doing that at a lower cost setting. So um, how, everybody's woken up to this. This is not really, you know, today's news. Um, there's no, you know, the, 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 it's almost by exception as opposed to by the rule that you're being cared for in the hospital. Um, so there will still be a need. There's still, there's still an investment of talent and technology that only makes sense in a, in a hospital. Um, you know, there can't be that unique specialist in every ambulatory care, even if it's possible to provide the service. Um, so I believe that for a very, forever, there will still be some kind of a hospital existing, but they're being complemented by so many other care settings that are more appropriate. You know, I'm thinking about, uh, I, I want to go down the technology route, but I'm also thinking of all the service line work that we did. We probably will see more hospitals close and more uh, systems acquire other hospitals but it's one of the things we did in the, the in our largest market which was a you know three million dollar or three million person market it was a pretty large market in uh, southern california so we did a lot of service line work and we stopped doing certain procedures in certain hospitals and 
yes, people had to drive a little further, but the level of care we were able to provide at the remaining hospital, we typically looked at it and said, you know, hey, we need to have a certain level of oncology in every uh, market, but we had specialty uh, oncology for the entire market, the entire region at one hospital, or we had orthopedics at one hospital, or we had, you know, those kind of things. And, uh, and, and that gave us the benefits of scale, which don't exist in, in a lot of things. And so that's the risk. It don't exist in a lot of markets because you have, you know, orthopedics across the street from another orthopedics across the street from another orthopedics, as is the case in, in New York city. So people have, have a lot of choices. And so if you're not at scale, you continue to, to struggle financially because those are very capital intensive, uh, uh the types of operations. Uh, let's talk technology. So uh, they talk about ambulatory surgery centers. They talk about uh, outpatient services. They talk about a growth in uh, in office visits. And I assume, I, I didn't see it here, but I assume a growth in telehealth visits and whatnot. Uh, if, if I make you the CIO for a health system today, uh, you know, what are we looking at in terms of a strategy to ensure that we're ready for this uh, dispersion? Of, of patients from a central campus model to really being seen all over, including in their home? So first of all, the CIO um, responsibility five, 10 years ago, even maybe even more recent, was really just focusing on care in the brick and mortar building, right? Um, you know, if a, if a clinic, you know, a clinic, was, it was a pretty simple setup. They needed access to our EHR, you know, they needed, um, you know, access to our technology systems, but we really didn't think about what is the technology um, footprint look like in the clinic? What does the technology footprint look like in a patient's home? What does the technology look, footprint look like in a post-acute care as much? I mean, we, we always needed that to an extent, but not as much as we do recently, right? It was always focused on our ORs, our ED, our patient inpatient rooms, and our waiting rooms, our administrative offices, all about that. Today's CIO can't think anymore only about the technology in the hospital. And they have to really quickly learn about technology in those other settings. What's the appropriate mix for today? This will continuously change, right? You know, you know, um, I know you know, Bill, about our patient room next uh, concept, and I do want to talk about that for a moment. We don't call it patient room of the future because that'll continuously change, right? It's more about just being able to see around the corner, you know, and being a little bit ahead. Um, so CIOs today have to take into consideration, number one is, like, like we talked about, what is the technology investment in the hospital? That doesn't change, right? And it's a little bit different because A, it's not what it was, but B, is also it's not what it is. It's what it will be, right? So you have to think about those new towers. What am I building for? That'll still be, um, you know, still make sense financially in five years from now. But they also have to include in their strategy all the other um, technology components. And whether or not we're talking about technology on, on a patient's wrist, at a minimum, they have to create the backbone and the, the uh, infrastructure for that, right? When they're planning for their core EHR, their core systems, they still have to, they have to plan for, we're, you know, we're going to be taking in data from patients' wrists, right? That's, you know, presented by them, not by, ca not captured by us. So, so the, the, the responsibility of technology and, and what that includes in the whole portfolio has just blown up. It's not anymore what's in the physical building. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. When I think of, you know, moving to the home, ambulatory surgery centers, and those kind of things. One of the first thing that strikes me is we used to have an old adage. It was a long time ago around security, which was physical access is access. You give me access to any server, physical access to any server, I can hack it. And I'm not even that good. But physical access is access. There's enough tools out there that you get there. So now I'm thinking, okay, great. We've moved everything to the data center that physical access to the servers is, is, is done. Physical access to the devices in the hospital, we sort of secured that. So we have a security department. They make sure that, you know, the equipment is not tampered with and people aren't coming in and out and doing things like that. Now we're starting to move into these remote locations and we don't have the same level of physical security. We might have cameras and those kind of things, and that's good and that's helpful. And then we move into the home. Um, you know, and I think, you know, how do I, how do I ensure that I have a secure connection between a home and my location? And I worry, I used to worry about people sitting in our lobby on our free Wi-Fi, getting on our network and trying to hack our, our routers and hubs and switches. And maybe that was just a CIO's, um, you know, paranoia, but now they could just sit in their home or somebody, uh, 
some somebody could sit outside their house, hack their router. Um, they know that there's devices in there that are communicating straight back to our hospital and our devices. How are we going to ensure that stuff? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I get. You know, I hope smarter people than I are really working on to identify the 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 traffic that's an anomaly, shutting down that traffic, identifying it quicker. Um, you know, identify it within seconds, closing it down within minutes, so that we can uh, keep hackers out. That's that's that continues to be as we continue to make this progress, and I think we need to make this progress in terms of delivering care in a lot of different settings. I worry, I continue to worry about the cybersecurity threat. So the first thing we do is we have one hour of meetings, one hour of status reports, one hour <laughs> of time sheets. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we figured this out. Um, all serious, all kidding aside though. Um, I think we need to learn from other industries um, that have a, a leap on this. We trusted our banking, right? We've trusted our money to, um, to open access, not just money in the bank, right? We, we went to ATMs, we do bank from homes on our phones and on our laptops and what are all that, right? Nobody's figured out. And I don't, and I think, I think the challenge will forever exist. You know, there's, I forget the saying, but it's, you know, security and comp- uh, security and convenience shall never meet, right? We get frustrated with a triple factor authentication and sliding puzzle pieces to make it match and all that kind of stuff to get in. So I think number one is, you know, we've forever trusted um, things that were important to us. And we need to, we, and in, in healthcare, we need to really align ourselves with that, maybe even be better than that. Um, th- those, those ways of securing what's important to us at a distance exists in other industries. And we, we need to really learn from that, number one. Um, and um, there was a number two, but I think, I think that's, that's, oh, the number two was, you know, as artificial intelligence continues to mature, that's something that's that we're that we're going to t- continue to take to our advantage. And you talked about, you know, behavioral trends, right? You know, I get a phone call from my bank if they know I've never ever shopped on a Saturday morning because I sleep in late, and now all of a sudden there's a charge on my credit card. I get identified. These are things that we need to to start to do in healthcare and use use behavior, use yeah. all the things that other industries are doing. Have you have you ever done that? Like you applied for a loan or something or whatever, and you get that text like within seconds now. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Yep. Emails, texts, well, you know, you, you, you log into your bank for the first time in three months and automatically they suspect it's not you, right? Or a different IP address or, you know, they, they, they match up the fact that you're logging in from Detroit, but your last credit card swipe was in Ohio, right? I mean, like, these are things that will help us with healthcare as well. I mean, they already are, but they'll just continue to get better. And I think that's how we extend the security wall or the security demark to patients' homes. It's no different. All right, let's hit on a couple topics real quick. Uh, Apple Worldwide Developer Conference, um, as he has stated uh, a long time ago, Tim Cook said, uh, if you zoom out into the future and look back and you ask the question, what was Apple's greatest contribution to mankind? He said, it will be about health. And they continue to make investments in this area. It's really interesting to to watch. So they now have this, uh, uh, they have a couple things. It, uh, the iPhone captures the way users walk. Now users can access their risk of falling with walking steadiness. And so the metric uses the built-in motion sensor to measure how fast and evenly you walk and those kind of things. So another, another way to use your phone as a, as a device uh, to help you live a healthier life. They're also adding to the context of their lab results, which is important. So now it will tell you that LDL cholesterol is bad. Uh, or yeah, it's bad cholesterol and whether your cholesterol is, is within the expected range. So they give you also some historical charting in there as well. Uh, but I think the, the uh, biggest announcement that came out of here is uh, Apple is now partnering with electronic health record companies, including Cerner and Meditech, to give users the ability to share their Apple health data directly with healthcare providers. Apple stressed that the data is shared privately and that not even Apple will have access to the information shared. Apple is also letting users share their health data with other individuals. A user may choose, for instance, to share their health data with their adult child. In this scenario, a user could see their parents' health data and receive notifications such as high heart rate alerts and change in mobility. The data is encrypted at, in transit and at rest, and users have granular control over which types of data to share and with whom. So, um, so data sharing, 
they have uh, updated way to look at labs and results, and they have the walking features. Uh, the data sharing one is interesting to me. As you know, Apple Health Records has a huge list of, of uh, organizations that have signed up for it that are sharing uh, portions of the health record through the, uh, through the iPhone. Um, and so, you know, this is the next move. So now not only do I get access to it, but I can share it with uh, I could share it with another doctor. I could share it with another health system. I could share it with uh, my family and create a care circle. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on on the progress that they're making around Apple Health Records? Um, first of all, I, I, um, you know, we don't leave home without this, right? It's nearby. Um, essentially, when by I, the way, forty nine percent market share of Apple. Yep, Apple yeah. Apple iPhone has forty nine percent market share right now. Yeah, I mean, number one is um, essentially what this did for us is two things. It allowed us to walk around with an entire computer where we are. So all the things we're doing with this, we theoretically could do on a computer. And it also added IoT, right? Sensors and cameras, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, years ago when people talk about Wallaroos and ca computers on wheels, I said, if you can't fit it into a doctor's pocket, it's, it, there's a, you know, there's a time, it's just not going to be relevant at some point. Nobody wants to be tethered, right? So there's a lot of advantages it brought. It brought, like you said, the ability um, to do things, you know, from a medical perspective for patients and contribute proxy, right? So that now you can do things in flight, a doctor, you can be, you know, family members can have access to information um, specifically to, to data sharing and to Apple or any others, um, you know, the Androids having, I'm, I'm a big fan of data being available um, for the betterment of my health. You know, I love you had another podcast talking about who owns the medical record. The hospital does, right? I'm, I want it. I want to have ac access to it because I want to, I want to, I want to be in control or be part of the decision making around my own health. There are certain things, obviously, you don't, there's certain bad, there's certain information that you don't want to get into other people's hands, and we have to be able to control that, right? But to the extent that I, as a consumer of, or, uh, or someone who cares most about my own health, I need to have data available to me. And if this is my, my way of getting data, the quickest and, and the most um, easiest way to get my data, then it has to be available to me. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of whoever can, can be the fastest in this race, uh, whether it's Apple or somebody else, of making it so that it's you know, across multiple EHRs, across multiple care settings, um, one record that follows me. And, and just like we have, you know, uh, it was an NYSE, right? I have one bank, but I can travel the world and, and get my, my money. I wanna have one way of getting access to my entire health uh, record. Yeah. So I, I, in that podcast, I, this is one of my hot topics. I believe this is uh, one of the most important topics in healthcare. Patient-directed interoperability, I think, will change healthcare over the next 10 years more than anything else that we're uh, even talking about or, or thinking about. I think data has the opportunity to, to change so many things uh, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, quality, uh, in terms of engagement. Right. So, I mean, so those are the things I'm looking at. And I, and I, I, I'm a proponent of joint custody of the medical record. Okay. I, I acknowledge that the health system owns it. They created it. They own it. And that's a common misconception, but they do own it. And that's fine. I just want to have access to it because it has so much value to me as, a, as an individual. And I, I love this. I think this takes us in, in, in the right direction. I'm a little disappointed and I, I reserve the right. Hopefully, Epic comes out next week and says, no, we support this. We're behind it 100%. But they were not mentioned from the stage, and they're not included in the press release. It talks about Cerner and Meditech. Uh, I would love to see Epic be a leader here. And I was a little harsh on them in, in my podcast because uh, I, you know, I, I treat leaders differently. And Epic is the leader. Epic is the leader over Cerner and Meditech. They've done so many great things for healthcare. Uh, they've they've taken our uh, you know our failed EHR implementations and really uh, addressed that significantly. Uh, they are an organization that listens very well to their user community. They do so many good things. Quite frankly, Judy is so connected to uh, more so than any CEO in the industry to their clients and uh, their advocates uh, for her. And they should be because she has done it's sort of a, a joint relationship. 
But that's why I'm so disappointed because they are a leader. They have an, an outsized, outsized voice on this topic and they've chosen to really drag their heels on this. And I really wish they'd get out in front and say, um, you know, we are open to this. We're not going to believe that we're the only ones that can build this walled garden. Well, we're going to go ahead and partner with Apple and get this out there. And I, I recognize that a huge number of people on that list are uh, on the list of providers that are working with it are Epic clients today. Um, but to be able to start to share that information and whatnot, they're just not on this list. And I'm, I'm curious why they're not there. I'm just a little disappointed on that. Um, I'm not looking for a comment from you because I don't want to get anybody in trouble on this show. I just want to keep myself in trouble, not get anyone else in trouble. Uh, let's, let's talk about one last thing. Let's talk about employees. And we've been touching on this a fair amount, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. A couple of stories. Texas Children's Hospital is giving a 2% raise and uh, an extra week's vacation to all their frontline workers. And uh, it's so important to take care of our staff. And that goes along with another story that I, I had pulled up and we're not gonna get a chance to cover, but it's hybrid work, how to prepare for a turnover tsunami. And in that story, oddly enough, it says that 54%, what's the numbers? 52% of North American workers plan to look for a new position in 2021 and 26% of workers plan to leave their employers after the pandemic. And I'm not sure that healthcare is uh, protected from that. I think that, that those numbers and those surveys that were done uh, probably are indicative of healthcare is um, clearly what Texas Children's is, is, is doing is acknowledging a couple things. One is that that exists, but also acknowledging the great work that people did during the pandemic. What are some other things that you've heard or that uh, we can do to make sure that we retain uh, our, our staff coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Bill. And I had a, a boss who one time used to tell us, when a recruiter calls one of your employees, if your employee picks up the phone and says, what do you, you know, let me hear? You've already lost that employee. You want to have that, you know, you're, you want your staff, you know, if a recruiter calls your staff, you want them to send that call to voicemail. Um, I mean, you know, there's always, there's always going to be a better job for everybody, but an employee who's appreciated and an employee is, I should say, rather celebrated is an employee who's going to really think 25 times before they, before they change to work at another organization. Um, you know, and, and as leaders, Sadly, many times um, leaders will, will try to pr um, motivate employees based on what motivates them. If an employee, if a leader is motivated by financially, they'll just talk about raises that are coming. If a, if a leader is motivated by work-life balance, they'll talk to their staff about how great the work-life balance is. I think as a leader, the first thing you have to know as a CIO or any other kind of leader is what motivates each individual employee. Some employees might love the fact that they can punch the clock at five o'clock and be home for dinner with their kids. Or maybe they have care issues for a parent or for a child and they need to you know, work that into their commute. Or maybe they're, they're growth oriented. So I think the first thing is really take a step back and say, you know, if employees are leaving, have I done a good enough job historically as a leader to know what, why, my, why my employees have been here? Have my, if, a, if employees leaving post pandemic, they probably wanted to leave a year ago. They just now have a new opportunity that didn't exist a year ago. And in, in IT, we're seeing that. You know, you needed, you know, historically, you needed to be, if you wanted to work at a hospital, you need to be in that city. You need to be in that state, whether it was for tax reasons, for liability issues. With COVID, it all changed, right? People are, we were desperate. We said, okay, you know, you work across the country. I need two more people. Boom, you're in. And that's just not just for IT, but that's for everybody else. So now all of a sudden, it's kind of like the world's become a little flatter, even in our little, uh, you know, industry here. I know personally many employees um, that many I, health IT um, uh, people that are now taking jobs that are across state lines, working out of their own home. You know, if I could work from home in my house for my own hospital three blocks away, I could work my, at home in my own house for a hospital that's three cities over, that's giving me a 10% pay increase. Or that's allowing me work from home where my own hospital says, no, you have to come back to work now, the pandemic is over. So I think it's really, really important to know all the time pandemic, not pandemic, as technology gets smarter, what are the motivators for your employees so they don't pick up the phone or recruiter calls? That's number one. Um, I think number two is that um, we have the ability, though, to do more for our staff that we didn't have in the past. It comes back to what you're saying, you know, way back in the beginning about, you know, the day, I love how the events you outlined from one of the comments, commentators about, you know, let's, let's think about how we're, how we're modeling our day, how we're, how we're taking accountability for our own for a team and for our performance, right? And let's use the tools that have all of a sudden become available to us 
to help our teams become uh, um, more motivated and, and more more loyal, I should say. Wow. It, you know, Eli, I love the, um, love the advice. It, when we look at employees, it has to be an N of one. Everybody's an individual. Everybody has different drivers, and we have to take the time to get to know them. Uh, I have kept you up to the maximum amount of time that I have been allowed based on the unnamed calendaring program that we all use. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, hey, Eli, it's always great. It's great to catch up with you. Thanks, thanks for coming My on the show. Bill. My pleasure as always, Bill. All right. If you know someone that might benefit from our channel, please forward them a note. They can subscribe on our website, thisweekhealth.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, Stitcher, and whatever else comes out next week. You get the picture. Uh, we want to thank our channel sponsors who are investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders, VMware, Hillrom, Starbridge Advisors, McAfee, and Aruba Networks. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.